Hi guys, welcome to another episode of US History with Lennox. And in today's video, we are coming out of World War II. And we're gonna look at what that meant here in America. But first, remember, after World War I, America just wanted to get back to normal. In fact, Warren G. Harding, when he ran for president, promised a return to normalcy. But as I'm sure you're aware, we couldn't get back to normal. We created a new normal during the 1920s. Well, the same thing will happen after World War II. In fact, we don't even talk about getting back to the way things were. We're looking forward now and looking at what our role is going to be, not only in America, but in the world as well. That's going to entail going into an entirely new conflict, which we refer to as the Cold War. But before we get to that, I want to look at what was going on here at home, because sometimes that gets overlooked by this entire conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. So what we're looking at today is America after World War II. It's like a prequel to the Cold War, kind of like episode one was a prequel to Star Wars. I don't know if this is going to be much better, but we'll try. Now, there were big questions about the economy after the war. A lot of Americans were worried that we might drift back into the Great Depression. And would there be enough jobs for all the soldiers coming home? Well, the truth was we're going to experience an economic boom. Very similar to the 1920s, you're going to see consumerism rise as these soldiers come home. But what's going to drive our economy during this time period is going to be defense spending, the money the government spends on our military. We're also going to see a lot of growth in our country in different regions, specifically in this case, what's known as the Sun Belt. The Sun Belt is the southern part of the United States, often referred to as the Southeast and the Southwest. If you need a geographical line, it's the 36th parallel. And that might sound a little bit familiar if you know the Missouri Compromise. But anyway, the Sun Belt is going to grow exponentially during this time period. Another thing that's going to help our economy grow is legislation that was passed in 1944. That's going to be the GI Bill. The GI Bill is a plan for returning soldiers. And the idea was we're going to give them opportunities to rebuild their lives or start building their lives. The bill is going to provide college funding for returning veterans, but it'll also give them one year of unemployment compensation to help them get started. Now, some of the GIs are absolutely going to take advantage of that educational funding, but others are going to use their compensation for other ideas, such as buying houses or starting businesses. It was FDR who signed this bill, and what we'll see as a result of it, the Veterans Administration is going to start underwriting mortgages. And if you had a VA loan, you were afforded the opportunity for a low interest mortgage over a 30 year period. Well, a lot of these GIs are actually going to take advantage of that and start building new homes. In fact, between 1945 and 1954, we're going to see nearly 13 million new homes built. This is going to drive up the housing market in our country, just adding to our economy. But everything wasn't perfect. Harry Truman, when he took over as president for FDR in the midst of World War II, was focused primarily, obviously, on foreign policy. But coming back out of the war, he had to deal with domestic policy. And this is where he's going to struggle. He's going up against a Republican-controlled Congress. And one of the first things the Republican Congress wanted to do following the war was reduce the power of an ever-growing union presence in our country. They're going to pass what's known as the Taft-Hartley Act. And the predominant legislation in this act would make closed shops illegal. Just as a reminder, a closed shop is a business that is only allowed to hire union members. Taft-Hartley was put in place to try to prevent that, to allow businesses to hire whoever they wanted. Well, Truman's actually going to veto this legislation, but because the Republicans had control and enough votes, they were able to override his veto. 
Going into the election of 1948, Truman honestly looked like a lame duck. And not only that, he was dealing with a split Democratic Party. And it was split because of actions he took with regards to civil rights. Truman is actually going to sign an executive order after World War II that is going to desegregate U.S. troops. No longer will our troops be segregated. Now they will serve alongside each other, regardless of race. He is also going to ask Congress to pass a civil rights bill that would make lynching a federal crime. Well, all this sounds great, and it was good, but you had Southern Democrats who were frustrated by this. And so the Democratic Party is going to split between the Democrats and what are known as the Dixiecrats. It almost harkens back to the 1850s. Harry Truman is going to run on the Democratic ticket, and his competition will be Strom Thurmond on the Dixiecrat ticket and Thomas Dewey on the Republican ticket. Now, most people assumed that because of the split in the Democratic Party, the presidential vote would be split as well, which would allow Thomas Dewey to win the election. And the press was so sure of it, they actually pre-printed newspapers with the headline that Dewey won. Imagine everyone's shock the next morning when we got up and Harry Truman had actually won the presidential election. Historians refer to this as the greatest political upset in U.S. history. That pretty much held on until about 2016, but we'll talk about that in another video. Going into his second term, Truman is going to introduce his domestic policy, referred to as the Fair Deal. Basically, it was just a continuation of the programs and progress that the New Deal had put in place in the 1930s. Things like extending Social Security benefits, increasing the minimum wage, and creating a national health insurance were the top ideas that Truman was trying to get through. But again, he's facing a Republican Congress, and they're going to block most of his ideas. The one idea, the one piece of legislation that gets through is increasing the minimum wage. Americans can now expect to make 75 cents an hour instead of the previous minimum wage of 40 cents an hour. Truman also had to deal with America's new role in the world. At this point, we're embracing it. We're not going back to post-World War I isolationism. No, we recognize that we are a world leader. At the end of World War II, America joined the United Nations. And in joining, we were set as a permanent member of the Security Council. The Security Council has members from all over the world. However, there are five permanent members, the Big Five. They include the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, France, and China. So what's so important about the Big Five? Well, on the Security Council, when new global legislation is introduced, each of the Big Five have veto power. They can veto any legislation in the Security Council, and they don't even have to say why. And there is no way to override those vetoes. If you think back to Article 10 of the League of Nations, there was a clause in there that stated that the League of Nations had sovereignty over all countries in order to protect the peace of the world. So basically, the League of Nations could call the United States into any conflict that they saw fit. That was one of the main reasons we didn't join the League. However, as a power on the Security Council that maintains veto power, this will allow the United States to maintain their own sovereignty. Another major agreement that was made at the end of World War II is going to be the Bretton Woods Agreement. This global economic agreement allowed for foreign currencies to be traded at a rate based on the U.S. dollar. The idea behind this is this would create an international monetary fund that would drive international trade that we would all benefit from. The only nation that really had a problem with it is going to be the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union sees the Bretton Woods Agreement as a tool to promote capitalism in the world. And what we're going to find going into the Cold War is 
communism versus capitalism is the foundation of the disagreement between us and the Soviet Union. Moving forward into the Cold War era and the 1950s, there's six C's I want you to remember because each of these are going to be part of this entire time period. The six C's stand for the Cold War, communism, containment, conformity, consumerism, and civil rights. And each of these will be addressed in upcoming videos. But for today, that's all I have. If you missed anything as usual, you can always rewind and watch it again. Other than that, if you liked what you saw, go ahead and like this video. And as always, you can subscribe to help support what I'm doing here, which is trying to teach us history. I thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.